All right, so welcome to the review session. Um, so I'm going to have to probably stay kind of more over here because I have the, the uh, being recorded on the screen here. So um, if everybody wants to shift more this way, that might you know be a good idea. So if you can't see things. All right, so let's start off with some blood stuff, and I think most of this is going to be kind of uh, mostly stuff you. You know, you just have to learn. So I'll probably go through this pretty quickly um, and spend more time on the hard stuff. If you guys have a specific question, go ahead and ask, all right? So you're okay with hematocrit and erythroblasts and leukocytes and platelets, right? Blood plasma, right? Uh, fibrinogen, right? We'll see that again. That's what makes fibrin. The different formed elements. Right, so far, so good. Yeah. Can it help explain like the stuff that's in the hemoglobin? The what? The no, the the next one. Can you explain that? Like. Yeah. So, um, the the main protein in hemoglobin, our main protein in the red blood cells, is the hemoglobin. And it's four of these subunits that come together to form one protein. <clears throat> Those are the globins. Um, and then the heme group is at the center, and it's hold, it has iron. And the actual, we'll see next a little bit later, that it's oxygen that binds the iron in the heme group. Okay. Iron what? I, iron holds the oxygen in place. So the reason oxygen can enter and leave is because of the oxidation of iron. So you're pretty good with the blood cell lineage. All right. Um, again, the, the hemocytoblast is also called the hematopoietic stem cell. You guys can use either one of those. And the idea here is that you go from one cell to the next to the next. So you should know a little bit about, we talk about the proerythroblast. You see a buildup of ribosomes and mitochondria and iron. And then early erythroblasts, we're building hemoglobin. And then late erythroblasts is when we lose the nucleus. Right? Actually, I think it's the normal blast we use the nucleus. Yeah? Can you explain the difference between an erythroblast and a proerythroblast? Oh, great. Uh, that's a good question. I'm trying to remember what I drew. Um, so basically, it's just going to be timing. So the proerythroblast's major job is to divide. It's to what? It's to divide. It keeps dividing and dividing. <clears throat> So it never really stays in pro erythroblast very long. It divides and divides and divides. It's sort of like a stem cell only for the red blood cells. And then in the early erythroblasts, <coughs> that's where you start getting a buildup of iron and you start seeing ribosomes. The late erythroblasts is when you start seeing a buildup of hemoglobin. Yeah. So is it the same thing as just the pro-erythroblasts? Pretty much. So once you get to the erythroblast stage, it's no longer going to divide. Okay. It's just going to mature. So iron builds up in the early erythroblast? Yeah. I will, it's not going to be that specific, right? Um, the one that I do want you to know is the normal blast when we lose the nucleus and um, we're sort of um, leaves the mitochondria and things like that. So knowing the difference between early and late erythroblasts isn't a huge deal. Again, the pro erythroblast, the pro means producing, so it's just dividing a lot. It's kind of like a, a unipotent stem cell. The reticulocytes, you should be able to describe what they look like, right? They have little they have little ribosomes in them that you see as a network. Um, again, the cells are in by macrophages. Bilirubin is the the repainter of the porphyrin ring. Right, and we get rid of that through making bile salts, and that goes out into your feces, right? The stercobulin we talked about, or you have your cobulin where it goes out through urine, right? And that's what colors your urine and feces. It goes out through bile. What? So the the bilirubin is used to make bile, which is helpful, but in the bile we actually, when in the digestive process, is converted to stercobulin which is what gives poo its brown color, right? Um, and then also some of the 
bilirubin goes out through the urine, and in the lit in the uh, kidney, it's converted to your copper. Yeah. How does John juice relate to bilirubin? So if you can't get rid of bilirubin efficiently, mm -hmm. and again, what this is probably going to be mostly is the liver is not making bile correctly, then it builds up in the blood, right? And you'd also see more coming out to the urine, so your urine would be darker. It builds up in the blood, and you can see that through someone's skin. So their, their skin tone will change a little bit, have more of a yellowish hue to it. All right, you guys should know about EPO, erythropoietin. What does erythropoietin do? Well, it triggers the maturation, <laughs> and if it's high enough, it will trigger the formation of more red blood cells. So triggers maturation of red blood cells? Mm -hmm. Giving you a boost of red blood cells. If EPO levels are high long enough, it will also start causing more red blood cells to be formed. Right, so going back earlier, so think about those steps we talked about. EPO will speed up the process of going from early erythroblasts to reticulocyte. If you have it at high enough levels, it will also cause the pro-erythroblast to divide. So it's kind of does more than one thing, like most hormones do. So that's EPO. Okay, uh, be able to define anemias, All right? Could you do that? What's an anemia? So there's failure in the delivery of O2 and the tissue. Yeah. So there's something wrong with the red blood cells. So we're not delivering oxygen efficiently. There's several different ways that can happen. Right, and we did aplastic and iron deficiency. Pretty easy to see why iron deficiency would be a problem because you need that iron to bind oxygen. Aplastic means lack of formation, right? So you're not making enough red blood cells. And then the other one is sickle cell anemia. Okay, so this is a genetic disorder in which the cells change their shape. So they're actually carrying oxygen very well, but under some conditions, they sickle and you get, they get stuck in capillaries, so an area does not receive enough red blood cells. All right, I think you guys can do the leukocytes, right? You should probably know these for the practical. Right. Again, I won't ask you to draw these, although I might give the description, right? So some of them are pretty easy to see, like this one here with the, the phone receiver, um, the giant one monocyte, right? Um, and you should know just a little bit about them. All right, so here's where we're getting to the interesting part, right? <clears throat> All right. So let's talk a little bit about hemostasis. So stopping blood loss. And again, here, the important part is that we're thinking about a multi-step process. And, you know, uh, there's several different ways. You know, you can think about re remembering this. You can make a catchphrase. You can imagine your mind is a little drama that's playing with all these things happening. But essentially, the three parts are vascular spasm, plug formation, And clot. So what I would suggest you do is sort of, you know, when you get home, is to look at what I've talked about and look through your notes and just sort of write down these three different categories. So essentially what we have when tissue is normal, right, when we have an endothelium that's not compromised, is that we have cells that are putting up, out signals that prevent clotting, right? And we talk about things like nitric oxide is one of the examples of that. There's endothelial factors that are released that stop clotting, right? anticoagulants. When we have damaged tissue, we are going to have signals, and there's several of them. The one I want you to know mostly is serotonin that are released by damaged tissues. Right? So let me see if there's anything else we should throw in there as well. I think it's basically it, right? 
And that serotonin is going to cause vascular spasm. So what do we mean by vascular spasm? Should the vessels get larger or smaller? Smaller, right? Vasoconstriction. The other thing that we talked about is that when we have damaged tissue, we also have exposed collagen. Right? So the serotonin is causing vasoconstriction. It's also going to lead to platelet activation, so the platelets are going to change their, their shape, and they're going to aggregate. So activation and aggregation. Those platelets themselves are going to release other factors that permit promote the same thing, right? So for example, we talk about serotonin and ADP. Those things are also going to pr promote more aggregation and more activation. And then we gave an example in class where you put ADP in a tube. It causes things, the platelets, to fall out of solution as they're aggregating. Now, we, don't, we want that plug to stay around, right? We don't want it just to float off because then it wouldn't be helpful. It has to really stay in the area where it's found, where we have the problem. So how do we lock in these activated platelets to the site of injury. Right, remember, here's our exposed collagen. What's going to link these two? Is it the Willebrand protein? Yeah, Von Willy Von factor. Okay. So, because it's German, I'll give them a little. Give them a little monocle, a top hat, okay? That's the one Billy Von factor. And it's going to bind the platelet, right? It's bound to the collagen, and you know that's going to promote plug formation. So that von Billy Von factor is running around your blood all the time. It usually is not doing anything because there's no exposed collagen, but we have exposed collagen now, so it, it binds to that and then it binds to the platelets, and we're holding the plug in place. The serotonin is also causing more vascular spasm, right? So at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to have clotting. So the activated platelets can also participate in clotting, right? And we had two different pathways, the intrinsic and extrinsic. Which one of those requires signals from damaged tissues? Extrinsic, okay? The intrinsic is really only stuff that's in the blood. Right? It, that's all it requires. It actually is helped about by damaged tissue, but it only technically requires blood. Okay? But it could be helped out. So again, there's a cascade that comes down, down, and down from two different directions. What you guys should know is the common thing, which is factor 5, right? 10, actually, right? 10. Um, and we're going to form something called the prothrombin activator. which includes 10, 5, calcium is necessary, and then PF3. Right? Where do we find the PF3? Is there surface protein? It's, it's a surface protein on what? On the platelet. On the platelet, right? So again, this little thing that I've drawn large scale is developing on the surface of the platelet. So that's the prothrombin activator. Now from there we take prothrombin and make thrombin. Okay. And what does thrombin do? It takes fibrinogen, right, and it converts it to fibrin. 
Which one of those is insoluble? In blood. Fiber, right? Remember, fibrinogen is one of the major proteins in your plasma. It's not clotting until it encounters the thrombin. Then it forms fibrin, and this is this fibrinish thing that starts to develop on the surface of the platelets, and it causes them to um, um, to form, you know, this network that's building around the platelets. Now, the final slide we didn't—I didn't really—we uh, did talk about PDGF, but I don't, and I think I mentioned in class that you should you guys should know that that's a growth factor that's released by platelets, because eventually, once we have the blood loss, we actually want to repair the damage, right? All we're doing now is blocking it. It's like, it's like duct taping the muffler to your car, but it's about to fall off, right? That's not a long-term solution. I've tried it, right? Um, so what you need to do is you need to get it repaired long-term, and the platelets also play a role in that, right? They release PDG, PDGF and other growth factors. That causes cells in the area to divide, and it also causes um, um, the fibroblasts in the area to start making more collagen and start making more elastin. So we're going to damage it. We're going to start repairing damage. Also, there's actin and myosin in these platelets, and they start pulling on the net, right? And that mechanical force actually also causes cells to really start dividing, okay? I think that's it for the, the blood clotting. Does that make sense for everybody? Again, I can't remember how many lectures we did. It's probably four and a half or five lectures out of the 11 or so. So don't neglect studying this stuff, because I do try to have fairly equal points from lecture to lecture. So, but now let's get into the real confusing stuff. Stuff that requires a little more thought. <clears throat> so, as I said in class, and we, we, we did, you know, um, the homework was trying to, to do that. And I guess the homework key is, is, is up right now if you guys want to look at it. What you want to do with the Wiggers chart, print out a fresh one, right, with no notes on it. And then I would suggest you guys look at that last slide for the last lecture that we did, where I talked about kind of thinking about it step by step. Right? Again, if you've not really looked at it, you guys should spend some time doing it. If you try to do everything at once, you're, it's, you're going to be really confused. Okay? The easiest way to do it is to think about things one at a time. Right? So think about valves opening and closing, for example, and we'll, we will go over this. And then think about, well, when do you hear sounds? Right? And then think about pressure changes and so forth. Right? Because otherwise, again, your mind will explode. Okay? Everything is related, so it, you know, once you get it, it should, you know, it will click. But everything is related to everything else. Okay? All right. I think most of this is pretty self-explanatory. Again, remember uh, a few things that I, you know, can cough and confuse people. The serous pericardium is a serous membrane. There's one that's on the outer surface here, right underneath the fibrous pericardium. There's one that's on the surface of the heart. The one that's on the surface of the heart is the visceral. The one that's away from the that is on the fibrous membrane is the fibrous pericardium. There's a cavity between them called the pericardial cavity. It is filled with serous fluid. I think you guys saw the pericardial sac on some of the cow hearts, right? Yeah, so it's, you know, so totally surrounding the heart. Again, part of it's on the heart, part of it's out there on the, other, on the, uh, the body wall. You guys are okay with the <coughs> myocardium, I think, right? And the endocardium. All right, um, so hopefully you guys are okay with most of this, right? This is also from lab. And the book does a good job of just talking about the anatomy, so you guys should be able to get that. Um, define an artery and vein, right? What's the trick here? Yes. Do I want to hear anything about oxygenation or deoxygenation? No. Okay, because if you do, I will take points off, because that's, that's where it gets confusing. And I hopefully you guys realize that's by now, that the reason is because the two different circulations are flipped, right? And the answer most people give is just based on one of the circulations. 
that's the wrong answer for the other circulation. So the better way is just to think that arteries are away, veins are towards, and then you can give me more details if I tell you exactly where we are in the vascular system. Pretty good here, okay. Are there chordae tadande related to the semilunar valves? No, you guys saw that on the cow heart, right? There's no chordae tadande there. There's our serious pericardium again. I don't know why it's there, right? There's our cardiac bundles. Um, again, the, the cardiac bundles are functional muscles. Right? They're kind of like muscles in the skeletal system, but they're called cardiac bundles. Um, they're connected to that fibrous skeleton, so when they contract, they'll, be some, they'll, they'll produce some movement in the heart. They're separated from each other, right? so that they don't start electrically interfering with each other, so that they're going to contract in a particular pattern. Right? Two circulations. This is a impor pretty important slide. So you guys should know all the stuff on this slide, and we will come back to this later because we build on it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of the currents. I did post two movies. I don't know if any of you guys have watched that. There's three movies on pacemaker cells and contracting myocytes, what they're like electrically. Um, there's three of them, but the first two are kind of probably helpful. The third one kind of goes into more detail than we do in class. All right, so let's talk about these. So what we have, again with the electrical system is we have an SA node which should be generating the pacemaker uh, pacemaker pacemaker based action potentials that are going to drive the whole electrical system. And then that action potential is going to pass through, you know, the internodal, the AV node, bundle of hits, and so forth. So the reason we're going to be able to generate a pace is because we have an action potential that looks like this. Okay? You should be able to draw an approximation of that action potential. I said I won't have anybody draw anything, but I'm going to have to insist that you guys can draw that. Right? If it looks like a little more like that, that's fine. But the important part is, is we have three different currents here and two thresholds. Right? We have a threshold one and a threshold two. Right? We can start at either point, but we'll start at the beginning. We have a sodium current, or sorry, a calcium current that causes the cell to become positive, and then it deactivates and we have a potassium current. The cell becomes negative, and it's going to become negative enough that we reach a threshold where the cell is negative enough for a channel to open. And that current is called the IF current. So the IF channel is going to open up. And it's actually a slow sodium current. So sodium is going to slowly enter the cell. And so it's going to cause the cell to slowly become positive until we reach this point, where we open up our voltage-gated calcium channel again. This opening up sets up a situation where it's going to become positive and repolarize and actually go travel back to being negative again, where we can also re we can reach the first threshold again. When it, the IF happens, mm -hmm. what's going into the cell? Uh, there's a little bit of sodium coming in slowly. Right, uh, but again, I would just remember an IF so that it's not, you know, you can remember the cells becoming positive. It's to keep it, keep your mind from thinking about it's a normal sodium channel. It's not, okay, it's a little bit different. They're kind of weird channels. But they are letting sodium again dribble into the cells from slowly until we reach that threshold again, okay? All right, so that is what's going to trigger an action potential that's going to travel through all the other cells, right? And remember that, so there's a few other cells that are doing the same thing, trying to reach threshold. But they're going to do it not based on their own currents. They're going to do it because an action potential arrived. And so again, this should set the entire heart rate. Right? If the SA node is setting the heart rate, and we're going to follow our electrical pathway, and our resting heart rate is between 60 and 100 beats per minute, what did we call that? 
we meet those conditions. We have a properly functioning electrical pattern in the heart. The sinus rhythm, okay? So again, that assumes a sin that we're talking about a sinus rhythm, right? The activity we did downstairs was talking about the sinus rhythm. Okay. So the next step is we're eventually going to reach, reach contracting myocytes in the atrium or the ventricles. They look like this. Okay. Um, we have depolarization, a little cowlick, a flat top, and then repolarization. All right. What is this in? This is in a ventricular myocyte or a um, contracting atrial cell. Okay. So it looks a little different. Time scale is very different, so the stuff we saw before was going to be kind of like this. Okay, This is much broader. Different currents. So this is a sodium current. It's really a voltage-gated channel, much like we've seen before. And it's going to lead to this, lead to this rapid depolarization. It inactivates somewhere up here. Right? Remember, sodium channels often inactivate. And then, as it starts to inactivate, we turn on a calcium current. So this is an ICA. Right? It's different than the last one because this one lasts about, well, anywhere from 200 to 300 milliseconds, depending on which type of cell we're in. So it is the L type calcium current. And L stands for long. And then we finally repolarize. This is a potassium current. Okay. This is not going to be able to trigger itself, right? Um, left on its own, if I took the cell out and tried to culture it on its own, it could not set its own pace, right? So it will go back to a baseline. It won't contract again until an action potential arrives, right, from the network that it's connected to. Okay, um, so a few things about this. So first, you have literally millions and millions of cells in the ventricle that are all depolarizing at the same time. That INA is occurring almost instantaneously in many, many cells. It's such a strong signal that you can actually record that. You can record that on an ECG. Right? What would signal is related to this? Rapid depolarization. Q, Q R, and S. Okay. Um, the reason Q, R, and S are so complicated as far as going up and down and stuff is because of the fact that there's it's not like we're having all these things depolarize in a straight line or a sheet, right? We're depolarizing in a complex pattern. So if you're an electrode here, sometimes the charge is moving towards you, sometimes it's moving away, sometimes it's doing, you know, kind of moving neutral to you because of that three-dimensionality of the heart. But the QRS is what we see associated with that. IK, the rapid repolarization, again, a lot of cells are repolarizing at the same time. It's a longer event, right? happens more slowly, we also see that on the ECG. That's related to what? T wave, okay? And then this QT segment, right, between a Q and T is the time calcium is coming in. And there's really no, ch well, it should be over here, right? Uh, there's no electrical change happening here. So that's why we see that flat line on our ECG is because the cell is positive. It's not changing at all. And we can only see electrical change. Right? For us to record something, it has to be a cell becoming more positive or more neg negative. It's just staying positive. So we can't actually record that. Okay. So let's think about the calcium that comes in during the plateau. How do we use that calcium? Well, it's like all cells that we've talked about, right? When we talked about skeletal cells, skeletal muscle cells, we knew that 
Calcium is important, right? Causes contraction. So the other name for this ICA, the L type, this is also the DHP receptor. Right? The cardiac version of it. And so we're going to let calcium into the cell. Right? Um, so it's acting a little differently. It's not just a stopper. It's actually letting calcium flow through it. The calcium enters the cell. And some of that calcium is going to interact with the troponin complex, right? And eventually allow actin and myosin interaction. This isn't uh, AMP1, so I don't expect you guys to, you know, memorize all that, right? But you should be aware that that calcium is allowing actin and myosin interactions to occur. If you want to go back and think about how it works in skeletal muscle, it's a very similar idea, right? All right, are we done? Have we, have we accounted for all the contraction? So we've got our calcium, actin and myosin interacting. If that's all that happens, is that enough? Not nearly enough, right? If that's all that happens, your, your heart muscle would only be generating about a fifth of the force it should, okay? So that's actually not the most significant part of allowing actin and myosin to interact. What happens next is that some of that calcium goes over and binds to the reanidine receptor. In this particular case, the randine receptor is activated by calcium. And when it's activated, it allows calcium out, interacts with troponin, allows actin and myosin to interact. This calcium accounts for 80% of the contract contractile force of the heart. It allows calcium to go where? Um, it goes out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? just like when we talked about uh, skeletal muscle. So that process of calcium coming in and then releasing more calcium is called calcium-mediated calcium release. And it turns out that's a pretty important phenomenon in a lot of cells, right? It's really important in smooth muscle as well, okay, and other, and other cell types. So that's going to explain all this. So this stuff, this calcium coming in actually changes the membrane potential and holds it positive. This is doing nothing electrically. It's just interacting with troponin. Yeah? Uh, you said that was called calcium. What? Calcium mediated calcium release. So mediating is like a go-between, right? OK, so let's see how we are here. So these are kind of the details of stuff. I think you guys, hopefully, you can have some good notes on this. Let me know if we have issues. Yeah? Can you just go over vagal tone? Okay, so um, we talked about this today as well. So if you guys look at your notes, remember that the SA node prefers to beat about 100 times per minute. Right? That action potential I drew earlier would occur 100 times a minute. The reason it doesn't is because it's being held down by acetylcholine. When you're at rest, the reason it doesn't go 100 beats per minute is because it's held down by acetylcholine. So right now, you guys are experiencing vagal tone. If you guys decide to leave here and then run up to the third floor, the vagal tone would go away, and you start adding some norepinephrine to get your heart rate up. The vagal tone, like, keeps normal, so we're not just, like... Yeah, otherwise your heart would always beat 100 beats per minute. Yeah. Yeah. Which is too fast. Yeah. I mean, it, it would just be a waste of heart energy, right? You don't need to do that. Uh, you'd have high blood pressure too, which would also not good. Because okay, I think we're hopefully okay. This is just again the pathways. You should know the pathway because it is really critical. And if you guys take pathophysiology, you'll probably learn a lot of things where the pathway goes wrong. But you need to know the pathway, the basics first. Okay, we talk about the sinus rhythm. There's our pacemaker cells. 
Right, there's ICA, potassium, and IF. And then here's an example of slowing the heart rate. So this is an example of vagal tone. Right? So this would be the normal thing going on, and then they're saying it's slowing down. That's <coughs> vagal tone. And then increasing the heart rate again, norepinephrine. Right, so again, the idea that the action potential generated by the pacemaker is just being carried in the next cell. Right? It's like setting off some dominoes. They're moving one or the other. Uh, this is a cardiac muscle contraction. This is actually a little bit, this is probably atrial muscle. It's a little bit broader when we talk about ventricular muscle. The same principles. Sodium, long type calcium, potassium. Right. All right, contractility. Again, as we mentioned, in a heart muscle, every single cardiac myocyte is involved in every contraction. So it's not like skeletal muscle where you can recruit more muscle to do something with more, you know, to lift with more force. If you want to generate more force, you somehow have to use the same number of cells efficiently, more efficiently. And so the way we do that is by increasing calcium levels in the cardiac muscle. And the, card, the, the, the concentration of calcium is proportional to the contraction. We talked about uh, positive and negative inotropic agents, right? Um, technically, the positive and negative inotropic agents are things that positively, it means it increases contractility. Negative, it decreases contractility. The way that's typically done is by increasing the amount of calcium or decreasing the amount of calcium. There are some that are a little bit different. They play around more with the acronymized interactions, but the bulk of things are going to change calcium. Norepinephrine increases contractility, as does epinephrine. Okay, so should we go through the Wiggers chart? Okay, so let's just, let's just see if there's anything else we, we've left out, and then we'll go through the Wiggers chart, okay? So here's that. With, this is all Wiggers, so we'll go through that. We'll just let us see if there's anything that's not Wiggers that we need to talk about. Are you okay with the escatory points? Yeah. yeah. Do you what want to just know where they are? No, you guys will learn that if you need to. I, it's, I don't think it's a sec. But uh, <laughs> you should at least tell, if you're, if you're examining a child, tell him that that's what you're doing, not just so they can't find their heart. Because um, you saw, you know, I was confused about my doctor. I thought he didn't know what he's doing. All right. Um, Love dub or loved up. Again, the this S1 and S2 are related to valves opening or closing? Closing. closing. closing right? If you hear a valve opening, it's a murmur. murmur right? And, and murmurs are abnormal heart sounds. There's a lot of them we talked about too, right? One of them is that whooshing sound where blood is flowing backwards. It's caused by an incompetent valve or regurgitated valve. And then a stenosis is when the valves don't open up enough. And so they're narrow. And so you hear kind of a creaky sound as blood is kind of forced through. Right? So think about, um, one way to think about that is if anybody's ever been rafting on a river and, you know, you go through an area with a lot of rocks, there's more noise, right? The stenosis is like that. There's a narrowing, and to get through there, there has to be noise. All right, the ECG, again, you should know what QRS, P, and T represent. We talked about QRS and T. What does P represent? Yeah, so the atrium specifically depolarizing, right? Um, you can't see the, you cannot see the atrium repolarizing because there's too much other stuff going on. It's hidden, okay? So you guys are okay with that? All right, so let's do the Wiggers chart. I can't remember exact order of how I suggested we go about things. So let's see. All right. So again, the first thing we need to be aware of, what we're drawing is not anything related to electricity, right? The Wiggers chart 
is just pressures that occur in three different areas. The atrium, the ventricle, and the aorta. Now, if we go back far enough, the reason those pressures are changing is because of electrical events. And so there are things that are tied to, atri to electrical events, but we're not showing them, right? They're just, we're just showing you the consequences. And so we have something that looks like this, okay, for the, what, are, what is this? This atrium. Yeah. All right. And again, this is all based on the left side. We have the ventricle. Right? And then we have what's going on in the aorta. All right. So let me see. I'll just do it that way. Okay. So that's essentially the Wigger's diagram, right? It's showing you from the beginning of a cardiac cycle, and these should be extended a little bit more, till the end of the cardiac cycle, the pressures that we would measure in these three different areas, the atrium, the ventricle, and the aorta. Now we know there are valves between the atrium and the ventricle, and the ventricle and the aorta, right? Those valves are one-way valves. They're purely mechanical. They open and close only because of pressure differences, pressure changes, right? And again, if you need to think about it, draw a little diagram of the heart, they are going to open and close to make sure that we have this flow pattern from atrium to ventricle to aorta. If we're ever in a situation where blood would flow opposite, well, the valve should have closed, right? So that's not going to happen. All right, so all we really have to do is look at the pressures between two different areas, and that will tell us what the valves are. So the first thing I suggest is you guys put the valve opening and closing points. They're only going to close when two things, you know, one thing that was lower is now higher relative to something else. And so they're going to close at crossing points, right? So we put one here, 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 and there. So one, two, three, four. Okay. So let's take these in order. So first of all, at number one, the pressure in the atrium is now equal to, and then it's going to be less than the pressure in the ventricle. So the ventricle is going to have higher pressure in the atrium. That would mean blood would flow backwards into the atrium. That can't happen, right? Ideally, right? We're talking about a normal heart. So what do we do? We close what valve? Bicuspid. Yeah, the bicuspid closes. Right. So the first thing I would do is just put the ones that are actually going to close, okay, or open. So up here, now the pressure in the ventricle is higher than the pressure um, in the aorta. So what happens to the semilinear valve? <laughs> The semilunar opens, right? And, and, and once it opens, blood can leave, right? And it makes sense because the pressure is higher in the ventricle, blood will flow from the ventricle down to the aorta, which is what we want to have happen, right? What happens at point three? The semilunar closes, right? We're just putting down the closing and openings first, okay? And then we'll go and talk about the next thing. And then what happens here? Where the pressure in the ventricle is now less, huh? Bicuspid opens. Bicuspid opens, okay? So the important thing, what I tried to do for your homework, right, is that from here to here, the bicuspid is closed, right? From here to there, the semilunar is open. The semilunar closes. It's going to remain closed for a long time because it's always, for a long time, from here all the way over to here, Right, it's going to have a higher pressure than the ventricle. So it has to remain closed. So we know that it's closed here, for example. Right. We know the bicuspid. Again, if it were open, blood would flow backwards, so the bicuspid has to be closed. It's remaining closed. The bicuspid is remaining closed here. And the semilunar 
is remaining closed there. Okay? So the cross just tells us when things dramatically close or open. But then they're going to remain closed for a while. Or they're going to remain open for a while. Right? And you can see that, again, just by comparing the lines. Okay, so what do we add next? Well, we add things about the sounds. All right? So, do we hear a sound at one? Yes. Yes, that's one. Do we hear a sound at two? No. No, because nothing is closing. Three, do we hear a sound? Yes. Yeah, that's two. And we don't hear one at four because nothing is closing. Right? Again, there are some cases where you hear them, but that's not normal. Okay? So that's the next thing. We could talk about, I'm not sure what we I said we should you should do next. Do you guys have that slide? Several different ways we can go. Um, let's talk about when the atriums, we'll talk, let's talk about systole and diastole next. Okay. Systole is what? Contracting. Contracting. Okay. So let's think about the atrium. At what point is the atrium contracting? Yeah, it's right here. That's why the pressure is building up. So this is the only time that the atrium is in systole. Again, just like the valves open or close, those are binary states. You have to be one or the other, either or. And you have to be one or the other. The same thing is true of systole and diastole. So if the atrium is not in systole, it's in diastole. So every other time on the chart, it would be in diastole. So if I ask you to, to, to if I ask you to put something, tell me when the, the atrium is in, in diastole, it's like you just can basically throw a dart at this and you'd almost always make it great. It's mostly, again, in diastole. When is the ventricle in diastole? Yeah. So really, from here, as the pressure starts to build, all the way, really, uh, I think I'd take it to over there, right? Technically, it's right about here, right? But either one's fine. This is ventricular systole, okay? All the other times, it's in diastole. Okay, um, we could relate the electrical events real quickly. Uh, again, um, I think, you know, electrically, you guys could probably put together the timeline of where things are in that electrical pathway on the chart, but it's really mostly all here, right? All that stuff we talked about with the electrical pathway is all occurring in that first little bit here, right, until we get to the myocytes, and then they stay contracted for a while. So what I really want to know is where's P, QRS, and T. P so, is the first one. Yeah, so P would be related to the atria depolarizing. If the atrium depolarizes, it also contracts, right? So P would be approximately here, let's say. Somewhere around here. Where's QRS? QRS. Well, QRS, remember QRS is like almost instantaneous, right? Sometimes you can't even see. Q or S. <laughs> so it's really short time scale. Well, let's think about it in terms of... S1. Uh, it's going to be around S1. Okay, yeah. let's think about why that is. So QRS is related to the depolarization of the ventricles. right? And it happens again very quickly. Once the ventricles depolarize, what do they do? Well, they have that, remember we had that little flat top, right? So what are they doing during the flat top? Remember that calcium is coming in? What's that calcium do? Increase. They're contracting, right? That calcium is coming in and interacting with actinomycin. Some of us interact with the RAND receptor, releasing more calcium, which interacts with actinomycin, allows actinomycin to interact. So really, the QRS is occurring a split second before the pressure rises, right? So it's occurring right around here, right? And then the T wave 
is occurring somewhere where we start to repolarize and we're going into relaxation, which starts, you know, either here or there, which doesn't matter too much, but somewhere around here, right? That's the team. <coughs> right? And then again, we said that, you know, the flat portion is this whole thing where it's contracting. Okay, so I think the only thing we have left is to talk about some of the named terms. So, for example, ventricular ejection. Between what two points would we have ventricular ejection? Two and three. Yeah, two and three, right? Because what's going on during there is that the, the semilunar valve is open. That means, and the ventricle is you know, pumping with a lot of force, is pushing blood out to the body. That is our ventricular ejection. It's pushing blood where? Out to the body, right? Through the semilunar valve into the aorta, and that's going out to the systemic circulation. So again, it's really between the time the, S, the semilunar valve is open. Now that brings us to these two areas, right, where we can actually do two different things. So first of all, what's happening to the volume of blood in the ventricle? in both these cases. It's staying the same, right? And if you look at it and think about it, the reason it's staying the same is because all the valves are closed. So there's no blood that can leave, no blood can enter. So those are our two isovolumetric conditions. So this one is which? Isovolumetric what? Contraction, right? Pressure building. and isovolumetric relaxation, okay? <coughs> All right, now the last, well, I'm not sure this is the last thing, but we'll see if we miss anything. We also talked about EDV and ESV, and we talked about this in the context of the Wiggers chart. We also talked about it today, okay? So in diastolic volume, right? It's the amount of blood that's in the ventricle when we, uh, after it's relaxed, right? And then remember it involved passive and active filling. So where could we measure that? In diastolic volume? Yeah, yeah, in diastolic volume. We would measure it in the ventricle, but where along this line? Three. Okay, if we did three and four, that's after the blood is left. Three. That's ESV. That's in systolic volume. EDV would be measured here, right? Because we fill the vessel, we 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 fill the ventricle, fill the ventricle, fill the ventricle passively, passively, fill it actively. All the blood's there, and then we close off the ventricle. So the EDV <coughs> would be measured here, All right? Um, we eject the blood. Everything's closed off we measure in systolic volume the amount of blood left in the ventricle after systole, after ejection occurs, we could measure that, and again, anywhere through here because it's closed off, right? And we can measure. Which one, had, what are the fillings again? So the filling, let's go through that because we kind of forgot that. So two types of filling. From here all the way over to here on the next cycle is passive filling. Right. That actually counts for 80% of the blood in your heart when it finally pumps. And it's really just a matter of the mitral valve is open, or slash the, the bicuspid valve is open. Blood's coming back from the body. It's just entering into the atrium and is falling into the ventricle. So we call it passive because there's no actual muscle force used to do that. Okay. And then at this point, the atrium contracts it pushes more blood into the ventricle because it involves muscle force that is active filling. Right? And again, it counts for 20% of blood in the heart. And again, this was at a resting heart rate of 75 beats per minute. If you have a lower than normal resting heart rate, 
your passive filling time is longer, so you would get a lot more blood into the ventricle. Right? And it counts for a bigger percentage because there's more time for the blood to fill. Can you just point out where it is again on each one is? So this is the active filling would only be here. So the first little. Yeah. And this is passive, right? Because remember, this, this cycle is, is linked, right? We would have to go to this one, and then we'd start again, right? So between here and here and here and here is passive. This is the start of a new cardiac cycle. Cardiac, new cardiac cycle, let's say, starts here. So passive, 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 active. And this is the atrium contracting, right? I think one of the first slides I showed you did have two different cardiac cycles together. Right. And if you look at that, or I think the, if you go to Wikipedia, they have actually a nice little Wiggers diagram, too, where it shows two in a row. And you can see how the, you know, the end of this chart just kind of melds into the beginning of the next cardiac cycle. And you'll see that there's a long time for passive filling to occur. Right? It's occurring between the semilunar, or I should say the, the bicuspid opening here, all the way until we have the atrium contract and go into atrial system. Right? And then once the bicuspid valve closes, then we can measure the amount of blood that was you know, came into the heart during all that filling, and that's the EDV. Okay, did we forget anything about the Wiggers chart? Okay, so as you can see, it gets pretty busy pretty quickly. So don't be afraid to download that PDF and print it out or do it on your pad and go through one thing at a time, and then once you feel comfortable with one thing, start adding some more details. Okay, and then, then start over from the beginning and see um, how things go. Again, everything is related. It just takes some time to get to all the relationships. All right. I will see you guys on Wednesday then. Or, sorry, Friday. Yeah, I mean Friday.